Well, you've made it. Now you're in medical school and you've decided that you want to be a surgeon. Maybe you've wanted to be a surgeon all your life. Surgery is a long profession to pursue and it's difficult. This presentation was written to answer some of your questions that you may have about going into the field of surgery. I hope you find it informative and it allows you to make good judgments before you choose a career. This is the time when you need to start thinking about what you want to do with the rest of your life. Because once you get there, there's a pretty good chance you'll never be able to turn back. There are many areas of surgery, and in reality, the general surgeon is the workhorse of most hospital faculties and staffs. The general surgeon is, by nature, usually the first to arrive and the last to leave. Except for maybe obstetrics and gynecology, because babies always choose to be born in the middle of the night, there is no other field that demands as much time, energy, and even money, especially money towards your education, than a surgical specialty. Some of the surgical specialties, for example, general surgery, cardiac surgery, orthopedics, and neurosurgery are incredibly time-consuming and competitive. This presentation will look at many of these areas of surgery and hopefully answer the questions that you find important before you leap. It's hard to believe that after four years of college and four years of medical school and then five years of general surgery that people actually want to do a subspecialty. Some people are simply lifelong students. But some of you won't be able to make that because you won't have the time or the money. Many of you will have school loans, and those school loans can usually only be deferred for the first two or three years of a residency. What does this mean? In reality, it means that if you're a general surgery resident, in general surgery is five years in length. Your colleagues who went into pediatrics or internal medicine will be able to leave their residencies, make more money, and begin to pay their school loans back, while you, in your fourth and fifth years of residency, will have your school loans accruing interest and even forbearance. Forbearance means that your school loans literally turn into credit card-like interest interest begins to accrue interest. You need to think about this before you go into a subspecialty. For example, general surgery is five years after medical school. And yes, it is a specialty even though it's called general surgery. Many people get this confused and when you tell them that you're a general surgeon, they have no understanding that it is one of the longest specialties that exist. Vascular surgery of which all general surgeons do some training in vascular surgery, has only recently been recognized by the American Board of Surgery as a separate specialty with separate qualifications and a separate certificate. Now you can become a vascular surgeon by actually matching into a vascular surgery residency. It usually requires two to three years of general surgery training and then the last two years with vascular training. These requirements are still being defined and this is not written in stone. Hand surgery can be obtained by using five years of general surgery followed by a year fellowship in hand surgery or it can be achieved by doing a plastic surgery residency. Trauma surgery of which you can have added qualifications but it is not a separate specialty is usually achieved by doing one year extra in addition to five years of general surgery. Again, most general surgeons do trauma surgery without this special year of added qualifications. Colorectal surgery is an additional year. Cranial facial is usually two years after a plastic surgery residency. You get the idea. What does it mean when your doctor says that he or she is board certified? Well, actually, it depends on what they're board certified in and what that specialty is. If you're an MD or an allopathic physician, all of the specialty boards belong to an organization called the American Board of Medical Specialties, and you can look them up on the web. 
This is an organization that recognizes whether a doctor is actually a member of a specialty boards. And all of the recognized specialty boards belong to the American Board of Medical Specialties. Beware. There are fake boards out there. There are doctors who claim to be board certified in nutrition. But while nutrition is recognized as a board of the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, nutrition in and of itself is not a member of the American Board of Medical Specialties and is therefore not a recognized board. So if your doctor claims to be board certified in family medicine with a subspecialty in geriatric hypertension, this is probably not a legitimate board. Beware. Look them up and check. You can check to make sure that your doctor is board certified by looking on this site. If your physician is an osteopathic physician, their member boards are recognized through the American Osteopathic Association, or AOA, and they too have a website. Just understand there are fake boards, and doctors do claim to be members of these fake boards, especially if they've taken specialty board exams and failed them. So what exactly is a medical specialty board? These boards are designed to give exams. And when you pass, you get a certificate attesting to your expertise. These boards do not attest to your judgment, your safety, your skill, your ethics, quality, or how well you run an office. They test your knowledge only. And for the most part, these examinations, which are taken every 10 years or sometimes even more, test a great deal of minutia. Once you've taken the written exam, many boards will require that you take an oral exam. Once you've passed both, you can be considered board certified. What does it mean if your surgeon says FACS after their name? This means that they're a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. The American College of Surgeons is a relatively old organization and was initially founded to help create ethics among surgeons. There was a day when surgeons actually received kickbacks for a patient who may have been referred to them. For example, Mrs. Smith needs her gallbladder out, so her physician sends her to a surgeon. The surgeon, in turn, cuts a check back to the referring doctor, saying, to, in essence, thank you for the referral. This is illegal, and this is why the American College of Surgeons was founded, for ethics and to create a greater sense of science, community, and fellowship among member surgeons. To be a member of the American College of Surgeons as a fellow means that the surgeon is board certified, he's practiced for at least two years, he has no issues with his license, and his complications are reasonable. This doesn't mean that the surgeon has never been sued or that he has no complications. But in order to become a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, the surgeon must usually submit two years worth of data to the college. It's reviewed. The surgeon is then interviewed. His background and all of his credentials are checked. And then he is inducted as a fellow into the American College of Surgeons. While all of this is happening, he's called an associate fellow. If a surgeon no longer is board certified, or loses their board certification, or does not maintain their board certification, they must ethically notify the American College of Surgeons that they are no longer board certified and, depending on the circumstances, can lose their fellowship in the college. A doctor can be board certified and not have a license, and a doctor can have a license and not be board certified. Arizona is one of the few remaining states in the United States that will actually give you a medical license after you've successfully completed your internship. Almost all other states require that you complete your residency training before giving you a license to practice medicine. In Arizona, this goes back to the days in the Old West when doctors were far and few between and they might have to take a bullet out by giving you a shot of whiskey and having you bite on the other end of the bullet. Arizona is one of those few states that still recognizes internship by giving you a license to practice, quote, medicine and surgery, end quote. You do not have to be board certified to get a license. Internship refers to your first single year after you finish medical school, 
whereby you practice in a hospital setting in a supervised environment. This goes back to the days when most doctors were allowed to actually practice by completing one year after medical school, called the internship year. Now, there's residencies and fellowships. An internship is the very minimum requirement in order to get a license in a few states. You are still practicing in a supervised environment as an intern. Most states will grant you a license to practice in that environment only. What does this mean? When you obtain your internship, you will obtain a license by the state of Arizona if you do your residency at, say, St. Joseph's Hospital that allows you to practice medicine only within the confines of that hospital. You can't take your prescription pad home. You can't write prescriptions for family members. You can't write narcotics for family members. You cannot practice outside of the confines of St. Joseph's Hospital if that's where you are doing your internship and your residency. That is the essence of being granted a residency license. Residency periods can be very long. Residency refers to those years after you've completed your internship year, basically years two through year eight, when you receive training to become eligible to sit before a board and take your examinations. What is all of this talk about board exams? What exactly does this mean? We'll talk about that in just a second. To say that you are board eligible is mostly a meaningless term. For example, the American Board of Surgery does not recognize this term at all. In order to become board eligible in surgery, you must graduate from medical school, complete an internship, and complete a residency in general surgery. Then you must take a written examination, pass the written examination, and then take an oral examination. At any point along the way before you've completed both examinations, you are considered board eligible. And that eligibility period lasts for about five years after you've completed your surgery residency. After five years, if you've taken and failed your exams, you have to go back and do more training. It only means that you're finished with your residency or your fellowship, but is mostly meaningless. It could mean that you failed your board exams and you're waiting to retake them. However, to say that you're board eligible if you failed your examinations and the five years has passed is meaningless and unethical. Yet many doctors will claim to be board eligible even though they've never finished their residencies. We've already spoken about the fake boards. Boards must be recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties if you're an allopathic physician and have completed an allopathic residency, or they must belong to the American Osteopathic Association if you're an osteopath. Any other board not recognized by these organizations is not considered a legitimate medical specialty. Please understand, doctors will take examinations by other organizations that claim to give you a certificate to make you board certified. This is not accurate and it is not legally recognized unless they belong to these two boards. An example is what I recently saw on a web page. There were two physician assistants who took the certifying exam for the physician assistant boards. This examination allows the PA to write after their name, physician assistant slash certified. But the web page said that they were board certified. Certification is one thing. Board certification is another. In this case, taking the minimum test required to become a certified physician assistant is not the same as the requirements necessary to become board certified as a doctor. This is misleading and unethical. Many years ago, doctors could take voluntarily their board examination. For example, surgeons in the 1970s took the American Board of Surgery written and oral examinations, passed them, and became certified for life. That no longer exists. Today, doctors must participate in something called MOC, Maintenance of Certification. Doctors all over the United States must continue to take courses to keep their knowledge current. Many doctors choose to fly to exotic locations, pay 
fairly pricey and hefty price tags to obtain these credits as part of a conference attendance. But this takes a lot of money and time away from practice, especially if you're a solo practitioner. Many will take courses locally to avoid the expense. Your licensing board, for example in Arizona, the Arizona Medical Board, will randomly sample the population of doctors in a state and make them prove that they have taken these courses before they will reissue a license. So beware. Maintenance of certification is required by your specialty board and it is also required by your licensing authority. So how exactly do you become a surgeon? If you want to become a general surgeon, it takes five years after medical school and you must match into a categorical surgery program. There are two types of surgery programs. One is called preliminary, which is one year in length, and then you bounce from that one year into another subspecialty, such as urology or plastics. General surgery is the third longest residency, generally between five and eight years. Cardiac surgery is seven, and neurosurgery is eight. Orthopedic surgery is also five years, and anesthesia is five years, but it's one year of a preliminary internship followed by four years of anesthesia. So in total, it too is five years in length. A categorical program will take five residents or ten residents or two residents and graduate them all at the end of five years. Beware of a pyramid program. In Arizona, for example, Maricopa County Hospital ran a large pyramid program. They accepted 20 graduates and graduated two. That means 18 got kicked out or ended up staying within the program for 10 and 12 years before they graduated. Basically, your cheap labor. That's the only excuse. If they take 18 graduates and graduate two, and we assume that the other 18 are incompetent, then you don't want to go to that program anyways. A preliminary year is a one-year program as you jump to anesthesia, ENT, urology, orthopedics, vascular, or plastics. Here's the most important point of this slide. When you go through the match, the hospital list determines your priority, not yours. One more time, the hospital list determines where you go, not your list. I'll explain this to you in just a minute. Let's say you want to be a trauma surgeon. You've watched a lot of television shows, you've seen ER, and you think trauma surgery is where it happens. The statistics are that one in eight trauma patients who present to the emergency room actually go to the operating room. That means seven of these eight patients you'll be called out of bed to go see and evaluate. You will be part of the trauma team, and yet they might just have a broken leg and that'll be taken care of by the orthopedic surgeon, and then you're spent every day walking around the hospital rounding on seven of eight patients that you didn't operate on. All general surgeons train in trauma surgery. There is a one-year fellowship available for added qualifications in trauma surgery, but it is not yet considered part of the American Board of Medical Specialties as its own specialty. That likely could change as trauma surgeons become harder and harder to find. Most surgeons don't want to do trauma surgery because simply the statistic is most trauma patients can't pay the bill. General surgeons usually do it all. And here's a list of most of the things that a general surgeon will do. If you have breast cancer, you see a general surgeon. If you have a hernia and need it repaired, you'll see a general surgeon. Esophageal surgery will most likely go to a thoracic surgeon, but that thoracic surgeon took five years of training in general surgery. If you get in a car wreck and you need your spleen removed, you'll be taken care of by a general surgeon. Colonoscopies and upper endoscopies were first and foremost within the technical prowess of the general surgeon. Why would you go to a general surgeon for a colonoscopy instead of a gastroenterologist? The answer is simple. If the gastroenterologist perforates your colon or perforates your esophagus, he or she isn't trained to fix it. A general surgeon is. If a colorectal surgeon is asked to operate on you for your colon and or rectal cancer, they did one year extra in their specialty. General surgeons also have exposure in orthopedics, ear, nose, and throat surgery, urology, 
obstetrics and gynecology, but today they don't get enough exposure to practice competently in all of these fields. Sadly, the general surgeon today is mostly relegated to the abdomen and colonoscopy and upper endoscopy. By law, every hospital must have a general surgeon available and on the rotational call schedule in order to have an emergency room. No general surgeon means no ER, and that means no hospital. Emergency room doctors do not make an emergency room. You can have 20 emergency room doctors but if they don't have a general surgeon on call or as immediate backup, there can be, by a legal definition, no emergency room. Drive by the Phoenix VA Hospital sometime and you'll see that they call it a life care unit. Now, veterans hospitals are unusual because veterans hospitals are owned and operated by the federal government. There is no federal licensing board for doctors. So to work at a veteran's hospital, all you need is a good license in any one of the 50 states. That means that the Phoenix VA, in theory, could be staffed entirely by doctors from Kentucky. These doctors do not have to be board certified in any specific specialty, and they don't have to be licensed in Arizona. What if you take grandpa to the VA hospital, and he's operated on and has a complication? Guess what? You can't report him to the Arizona Medical Board because Arizona has no legal authority over him if that doctor has a license in Missouri or Kentucky or Florida. That's a problem with veterans hospitals and it has yet to be addressed on a federal level. The other rumor that goes around is that if you work at a VA hospital you can't be sued. Nothing could be further from the truth. How this rumor has been propagated I have no idea but I can show you the statutes and the federal law and several physicians who worked at veterans hospitals who were sued. Remember this when you rotate through a veterans hospital as a student or a resident. You have liability just like any other resident, except your liability is controlled by the federal government and not the state. Let's go back to this topic of being board certified. Boards in and of themselves do not certify anything. The term board certified actually is not endorsed by many of the medical specialty boards. They do not certify to your competence. They do not certify to your intelligence. They do not certify to your technical skills. That is why the proper title when a physician takes, completes, and passes their written and oral examinations at the conclusion of residency, a title of Diplomat of the American Board of Surgery. Note the spelling. There's an E at the end. Without the E, you're a diplomat. We're not diplomats. We're not politicians. We're diplomats. That's the formal title. You're a diplomat of the American Board of Surgery or the American Board of Internal Medicine. You're technically not board certified in anything. It's semantics, but it's ethically important to make this distinction. I've already mentioned how you become board certified in surgery. You have to complete your residency. A residency in general surgery at Duke University is eight years. A residency at Washington University in St. Louis in general surgery is seven years. You have to take your written exam and some require an oral examination. Not all boards require oral examinations. But I want to take a minute and finish the conversation that I started about the match. When you finish medical school, you will enter the match. This will align you with where you are going to do your internship and your residency. I told you that the hospital's list takes priority. Let me explain this and listen very carefully. Let's say that you were told that your list takes priority. So you interview at five programs. You interview at St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix, at Maricopa County in Phoenix, at Banner Samaritan in Phoenix, and the University of Arizona in Tucson, and you interview at Harvard. Well, everybody wants to go to Harvard, so you put Harvard first on your list. How will the computer system ever determine 
of 4,000 people who want to go to Harvard, who will they take? This is where the hospitals list takes priority. Hospitals are paid by the Medicare system about $150,000 per year per resident. They in turn take a third of that money and pay your salary. He who holds the money makes the choice. Harvard then submits their list. And on their list, they posted you number one. Guess where you're going to do your internship? You're going to Harvard. But let's say that Harvard listed you number one and you listed Harvard as number five. Guess where you're going to go do your residency? You're still going to Harvard. This makes no sense. Actually, it does. If you list any hospital on your list and that hospital ranks you number one and you listed them anywhere on your list, that's where you're going. Does this make sense? One more example. Let's say now that on your list, you've listed St. Joseph's Hospital as your number one choice, but St. Joseph's listed you as number three on their list. So whoever St. Joe's put as number one is going to St. Joe's, and the chances are pretty good that it won't make it down far enough to pull you in to do your residency there. Another example. Let's say you applied to Harvard, Yale, Johns Hopkins, and Cornell, and Johns Hopkins listed you as number one. But you interviewed at Johns Hopkins, and you didn't like them so you didn't put them on your list at all. Now, the computers keep searching for a hospital that listed you as number one, and hopefully it's on your list, because that's where you're going. It's complicated, but your list does not determine where you do your residency. Your list only tells the computer system if you're interested in any of those hospitals that may have ranked you. Once you've matched at that hospital and you complete your residency, you'll want to become a fellow. And that could be a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, fellow of the American College of Physicians, fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians, or of the American College of Surgeons. Usually, you have to pass your boards, stay in practice for about two years, submit all of your cases, have them reviewed, and then they will interview you and have a medical license in good standing before you can become a fellow of these organizations. It's an admirable goal to become a fellow of a college. It means that you've done your homework, you're in good standing, and you've practiced unsupervised safely for many years. So when you go see the doctor, you actually share a great deal of responsibility in making sure you're happy with the doctor. You now have the education and the ability through the internet to check up on your physicians or your physician assistant. No longer does a doctor make a referral for you that you don't have a say-so in. For example, let's say that your doctor refers you to me. Dr. Crutchfield, you need to be able to go to any of these websites here to check on my credentials to make sure that I'm who I say I am and that I have the requisite training and that my license is in good standing. If you go to the Arizona Medical Board, the first one here, www.azmd.gov, you can look up any licensed allopathic physician in the state of Arizona to see whether they've been reprimanded or whether they have a clean license. And you can look up the details of that reprimand. You share responsibility in your health care. It's important that you check on your doctor's credentials. So while you're at it, Google yourself. You'd be surprised at how many applicants to medical schools forget this. How many times an applicant to medical school forgets that an admissions committee will actually look them up? They'll Google them. They'll look them up on Facebook or MySpace. Whatever you do today will show up on the Internet about you. Whatever pictures you post, there is always residual memory left about you on the Internet. And while you're looking up your surgeon or your family physician or your gynecologist, your plastic surgeon, and you're checking his credentials, check yourself out. You are now in charge of your career. As a medical student, it begins now. If 
you've made mistakes in the past and you've posed nude for a magazine and you don't want those pictures out there, remember your patients can find these too and it could be embarrassing for you. Everything from traffic violations to divorce settlements to child custody cases are available online. Your home can be searched along with your home address, how much you paid for that home, whether you're board certified. It's all there and the patients will look. They will look you up. So while you're looking up your doctor and taking responsibility for your own care, go ahead, Google yourself. You might be impressed. How are you ever going to pay those school loans off? Well, let's talk about money. How much does a surgeon make? Well, we have to decide. Does that mean how much I build or how much I collected? What about the insurance companies and how do I become established with them? What about Medicare or Medicaid? In California, it's called Medi-Cal, M-E-D-I-C-A-L. That's California's Medicaid system. In Arizona, it's called Access. And what about your overhead expenses? Because you have to pay rent, you have to pay the internet bill, the phone bill, the electric bill. And every year at Christmas, your front office receptionist will want bonuses. And for Thanksgiving, they might even want turkeys. If you don't watch the money, where it comes from, and how it's billed, you will suffer when it comes time to collect these expenses. Let's use some real-life examples from my own income. One of the best years that I had in practice, I billed over a million dollars. I collected about 600000 that year, and after overhead and taxes, I brought home about $200,000. But here's what you don't understand. In order for me to bill $1.2 million, I was on call every other night for a year. Most general surgeons will make between four dollars and $500,000 before taxes, before overhead, per year. What does this mean? If you make $500,000 and you've paid overhead and taxes, you will bring home about $200,000. The average salary today for a general surgeon is about $250,000 to $350,000 per year. That's about average, but that's taxable income. After taxes, you'll take home between $100,000 to $200,000 to $250,000 a year. And it literally depends on how tight and how cheap you are. If you don't buy new pillowcases for your exam rooms, if you don't buy hand cleaner, if you don't buy paper towels, if you don't pay for a laundry service, if you make sure all of the lights are turned off during the day, you can be as frugal as you want to and your office can be as dirty as you want it to be. This shows up in your bottom line and it shows up when your patients come to visit. If you choose not to install a stereo system in your office or not have an answering system or not pay for internet access, all of this affects your bottom line. And my experience after practicing in Arizona for nearly 20 years is that most doctors are extraordinarily frugal. Most doctors do not have electronic medical records and if they do, they're usually, not always, but usually bottom of the line. Most offices didn't have internet access. Most offices do not have voicemail where you can leave a message for the physician. Most offices, sadly, were dirty. There is no regulatory agency in Arizona that routinely checks and licenses doctors' offices. Hospitals, yes. Private doctors' offices, no. Keep this in mind if you see a dirty office. Medicare pays doctors on a fixed rate and fixed schedule set by the government. In general, Medicare pays about a third of what it actually costs to take care of a patient. Rates are fixed every year and they're government controlled. Sadly, rates have gone down every year for the past 15 years for a general surgeon. What does this mean? In 1985, a general surgeon made about $1,100 to take out a gallbladder. Today, they make about $650. $50. That's in actual dollar amount not being converted. This means that in the 1980s, $1,100 was $1,100 in 1980 dollars. And that $600 today is $600 today. Those are not adjusted for inflation. If you do so, the drop is even worse. 
Medicare was actually designed to take care of the elderly, impoverished population, basically the poor. However, every American over the age of about 65 becomes eligible, regardless of their income or retirement status, for Medicare. Medicaid is based on income, at least in Arizona. In California, it's called Medi-Cal. What does this mean? Let me give you a real life example. If Bill Gates turns 65 tomorrow, he's eligible for Medicare. And quite frankly, he should be. He's paid into the system. He is entitled to Medicare's benefits. But think about about this he will also get the same care as everybody else over the age of 65 while the government picks up his tab I'm not trying to make a political statement please don't interpret my words otherwise I'm trying to show how the system is for everyone when Bill Gates turns 65 and he needs his gallbladder out his surgeon will be paid six hundred and twenty five dollars if Bill Gates sold a copy of Windows 7 or Windows XP or Windows Vista to a 65 year old who sets the price for that product and does the 65 year old get an automatic discount because of their age of course not that's the problem with Medicare is that it does treat everybody equally it treats the doctors equally it treats the patients equally regardless of their ability to pay Bill Gates paid into the system he is entitled to care under Medicare regardless of his ability to pay or not Interestingly, I used to practice in a border town of Bullhead City, Arizona, Laughlin, Nevada, and Needles, California. I practiced for six years, and for those many patients that I operated on from Needles, California, I was never able to successfully obtain payment on any patient who had California's Medicaid system, known as Medi-Cal. Even though Medi-Cal was properly billed, with the proper codes, the proper numbers, payment was never obtained. I have no idea why this was. I have no idea if it was because California as a state was near bankruptcy. But if I did obtain payments, they would have been at a fraction of what the usual payment would have been through the federal system of Medicare. These are issues that you must take into consideration when you practice medicine and who you see in your office. Remember, you have overhead to pay and bills to pay. You have employees who depend upon you for jobs. The mother of three children may be your receptionist. She depends on her income to feed and clothe her children. If you saw all Medi-Cal patients, she wouldn't have a job. This is a matter of simple economics. Now let's talk about the global fee. Most medical students are unaware of this. In general surgery, we have three global fees. Think of these as a zero or 10 day or a 90 day guarantee on your surgery. There are some procedures that do not have a global fee and other procedures have a 10 day global fee. What does this mean? If I put an IV in your jugular vein called a central line, there's no global fee. That means that any complications related to the placement of that central line that I have to take care of, I can bill for those complications. But the removal of your gallbladder has a 90-day global fee. If you have a complication related to my operation in taking out your gallbladder and it falls within that 90 days, I must take care of you without any charge to you as the patient as long as the complication is related to your gallbladder surgery for 90 days free of charge. So depending on the procedure you do, you might be unable to bill or collect for any further procedures for 90 days after you've operated on somebody. This is where codes become important. There is a code for every diagnosis you can think of. Let me give you an example. If I remove your gallbladder and 30 days later you have an abscess related to that surgery, I will drain the abscess it is free of charge because it is within the 90 days from surgery. But let's say that you have complications from your thyroid medication. That's not related to your gallbladder surgery. And if I treat you and adjust your thyroid medications, I can bill for that. But it must be accompanied by the proper billing codes. Just to drive the point home, let's look at some examples. So gallbladder surgery has a global period of 90 days. Post-op day 9, the patient has an abscess. I reoperate on day 11, I drain the abscess, I bill Medicare 
$2,500. My payment is $645. Your payment from Medicare for being 10 days in the hospital because of the abscess is zero. Even though I rounded on you for 10 days, I collected $645. Put this in perspective. If you're in the hospital for 10 days and your internist takes care of your pneumonia for 10 days, in theory, he or she could make more money than that the surgeon made from removing your gallbladder. If you're thinking the healthcare system is messed up, you're right. Let's look at another example. An 83-year-old comes with appendicitis. We remove the appendix and then he's in the hospital for two weeks after surgery with an ileus. Medicare pays about $425 to remove the appendix. If you had private insurance, like Blue Cross Blue Shield, they would normally pay about $850. Keep in mind, in 1970, they probably would have paid $2,000. But ileus is the new diagnosis and it's not a surgical complication. You can bill and probably be paid for the few extra days that you spend in the hospital. Yes, ileus is a result of the appendix surgery, but it just happens, and the surgeon won't be penalized based on the rules that Medicare has for taking care of you for that ileus. Assuming that you code it and send in your paperwork with proper documentation to Medicare in order to be paid properly. Want to see how much doctors make? Go to this website and take a look. In my opinion, these are inflated about 25% over what the actual numbers are. The average surgeon will work between 60 and 120 hours a week. Most of my time, I probably worked about 80 hours a week. And your call at night will vary from every night to every six night. What does this mean? If you're on call every night, that means you must answer to the emergency room every single night. There are doctors in small towns in America that maybe have a population of 1,500 people to 3,000 people that are still lucky enough to have a small community hospital where they might only have one surgeon and he takes call every night. This is almost impossible to maintain. You can't go to sleep with a phone ringing and or waiting for the phone to ring that off. It simply is incompatible with life. If you're on call every sixth night, it means every sixth night, like clockwork, you'll be there to answer the phone when it rings in the middle of the night, getting out of bed, driving to the hospital to see a sick patient. Here's the next statistic you need to be aware of. One in four patients will not pay their hospital bill at all. One in four patients will simply stiff you. One in four patients have the money to pay and simply won't. That is the statistic. To counteract this, there's a new concept called hospitalist or surgicalist. These are surgeons that basically live in the hospital for 24 hours. They operate on you and then they sign you out to an oncoming doctor or an oncoming surgeon. Some programs require you to actually live in the hospital for a week at a time. After your week is up, you sign out to another physician or another surgeon, and then they take over for the next week. Within the past five years, this has become a very hot topic. The reason that doctors began to be paid for emergency room call started actually with neurosurgeons. Neurosurgery residency is an eight-year residency. Malpractice insurance in 2011 for neurosurgeons in Arizona is about $175,000 per year. With these high overhead costs, neurosurgeons, in order to be paid on a trauma service, simply need to be paid in order to pay their malpractice. Otherwise, they'd go out of business. And that's what happened. All across America, neurosurgeons began to leave hospitals and began to quit and began to do only outpatient back surgery or only inpatient neurosurgery without taking emergency room call. This forced hospitals to begin paying their doctors to take call. Years ago, it was a duty of the doctor to the community to take call. But today, it's a matter of simple economics. With malpractice rates so high and malpractice awards so high, Doctors, in order to stay financially viable and pay their overhead, which were rising, and their office help, more than minimum wage, they simply needed to find another way for income. Pay for ER call became the norm. This, however, only partially covers the losses for the patients who don't pay their bills. 
On average, a general surgeon will do about $200,000 per year of unpaid care. You cannot write this off on your taxes. This is simply work that you have done for free. It is a common misconception that doctors can write off free care and deduct their tax bill. This is not true. If I operate on you and take out your appendix and you do not pay the bill, that means I simply worked for free. Try this with your plumber. Try this by walking into the grocery store and walking out with a couple of new stakes under your arm. See how far you get. Only not-for-profit hospitals, known as 501c3 corporations, can write off losses. Hospitals that are non-profit do not pay income taxes and can write off these losses under certain federal laws. Now you're thinking, do I want to be a surgeon? I've got five years of residency experience. I owe $300,000 in debt in school loans. Dr. Crutchfield has told me one in four patients won't pay my bill. If I live in California, there's a good chance that Medi-Cal won't pay me. And I probably won't sleep. And that's assuming that the hospital actually pays me for call. Now you might want to choose what's called a lifestyle specialty. Dermatology, ophthalmology, pathology, anesthesiology with some qualification there, and radiology with some qualification there. Today, most family practice and internal medicine physicians won't take emergency room call. They'll turn their patients over to inpatient hospitalists after 5 o'clock. They'll go home and, for the most part, have a good evening with their family. Family practice and internal medicine, and this is qualified, there are exceptions to everything I'm telling you, have become lifestyle specialties. Anesthesiology is only considered because they often are able to take the next day off without call and do not make rounds on their patients. But anesthesiology is very much a nighttime specialty, as is radiology. If you don't believe me about how much doctors pay for malpractice, I'll give you a link where you can look up most states that will tell you what the costs are of malpractice coverage. In Arizona, we basically have one company called the Mutual Insurance Company of Arizona, which insures about 80% of the doctors in the state. There are a few other companies that dabble in malpractice insurance coverage, but most of these companies, such as St. Paul and the Doctors Company, have mostly pulled out of Arizona. Other companies, such as General Electric, which is owned by Warren Buffett, have all but pulled out of Arizona. Think about this. I paid $53,000 a year the last year that I was in practice in 2010. This is like buying one or two new BMW automobiles every year with cash and then handing those keys for somebody else to drive away in. You will never see this money again. This is $53,000 spent as required to have privileges at a hospital that you must have to cover your liability. Neurosurgeons will pay $175,000 a year. Gynecologists and obstetricians, about $75,000 a year. Heart surgeons, $125,000 a year. If you would like to review these rates, I've given you a link here that you can check and go directly on the internet to look at rates in many different states. Surgical professions are the highest liabilities. A family physician in 2010 paid on average about twelve dollars to $15,000 per year in liability. Most doctors simply can't quit and walk off the job. Think about this. If you decide you want to become an orthopedic surgeon and then when you're 50 years of age are burned out from taking night call, tired of not getting reimbursed, you you owe a home mortgage and you still owe a hundred thousand dollars on your school loans and you just can't take it anymore you can't quit the reason you can't quit is because of something called tail coverage tail coverage is two years worth of malpractice coverage that you must buy to protect you for the statute of limitations and in most states that's about two years let me give you an example let's say that as a practicing general surgeon I wanted to quit today 
day, I would have to cough up $108,000 and pay that to my insurance company to keep me from being sued for the next two years, even though I've stopped practice. Because by law, a patient can sue me for what's called the statute of limitations. And even the statute is vaguely worded. The statute actually says you can sue for up to two years after the event is discovered. This is why you are required to keep charts and records on children until their 18th birthday. If you operate on a child and take his appendix out at seven years of age and when he's 15 has a bowel obstruction because you accidentally left a suture in that wrapped around a piece of intestine, you can still be sued for that even though it's been 10 years since the operation. That's why doctors buy tail coverage. If you don't buy tail coverage, there's a pretty good chance you will be considered uninsurable for the rest of your career. So, unlike the guy who works at Walmart who can simply quit and walk off his job, in order for you as a doctor to quit, you have to finish paying off your school loans and cough up $100,000 for your tail coverage. I've given you a lot of information in this presentation but I hope you found it informative and enjoyable. You've learned about what it takes to become a surgeon, what it takes to become board certified or a fellow of your respective college. You've learned about licensing in various states and how veterans hospitals operate differently than your local state hospital. You've learned about malpractice insurance and tail coverage. You've also learned about what it takes to become a subspecialist. And importantly, you've learned that once you've made this commitment in medicine, you can't turn back unless you're very, very wealthy and independently so. If you don't buy tail coverage and you're sued, it is possible for a lawyer to put a lien against your home so that when you die, your home and your earnings will not belong to you. It's very important that you understand these concepts as you move forward in your career because owing on your school loans is just the start of the indebtedness that you're about to incur. Once you've gone into private practice and if you practice in a surgical specialty, remember tail coverage. When you take your first job out of residency, you need to negotiate in your contract who's going to pay for that tail coverage if you decide to move and take another job in another state. These are the things that most individuals and medical schools don't teach. This is the business of medicine, not the science of medicine. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, or if I've quoted any errors, please let me know, and we'll do the best to make this presentation as accurate as possible. Thank you.